I'm going to stand up. You're going to stand up? I'm going to stand up. You, can I stand up? You can stand whenever you want. You want to stand there? No. Do, do you want to stand? Oh, this word is working. Yeah. You can stand from here? Yeah. Do you mind if we stand here? <laughs> Hello! <laughs> How are you all doing? Uh, they didn't serve you any ice cream or brownies yet, right? That's the reward if you stick around. <laughs> we know, uh, we've been through this before. <coughs> we've done it. We know what we're doing. Uh, hi, I'm, my name's Sean. I'm the uh, public relations manager for Ben and Jerry. So I get to uh, serve in the role as moderator for uh, our discussion today. Um, and I shared yesterday with the NYU folks that uh, some people saw in the program that, that I'm the uh, PR manager for Ben and Jerry's. But what a lot of people don't know is that I'm also on Jerry's official payroll as his image consultant. Just look at him. What a job I'm doing. Huh? <laughs> if you don't notice, the uh, on his shirt is pinned one of the Do Goody Brownie packages. That's not. Uh, it, that's not a mistake. It's not an error. Uh, it wasn't unpackaging a case today and, and having a staple fly out. It was uh, a conscious decision, and that's because the reason why we're we're here is uh, that Ben and Jerry's is trying to support Grayston and their efforts as they're kind of tackling get into the retail world. Of, uh, of selling their brownies. And Jerry's gonna give you a little bit of background, but we've had uh, about 20 years of history with Grayson as a partner, as a values-led supplier. Uh, and and we've kind of seen them as our crown jewel of, of those stories. Now we work with a lot of other vendors who, uh, as we try to purchase goods and services for, for Ben & Jerry's, we try to do that through organizations that do something better in the world than just sell, uh, you know, provide a commodity at the cheapest cost. Um, so, so Grayson is really one supplier for us that's really kind of led the way and, and has been a, an incredible example of how they can operate their business and do something good for, for the community while providing a, a really good, uh, you know, excellent quality product. Uh, and so we've been here uh, for a two-day tour and, and working on what we can do to get out there and, and try to focus on the do-goody. Uh, so we're going to have, uh, Jerry's going to give you a little history about Ben and Jerry's and kind of uh, how we got involved in uh, in Grayston and, and, and what that partnership's been about. And then uh, Julius is gonna give you a little more in depth about Grayson. And then after that, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And uh, every, does that sound, make sense? Everyone good? You're with us so far? <laughs> then, then we will not, uh, we won't hesitate any further. We'll bring up Mr. Jerry Greenfield. <laughs> uh, nice to see all you guys. It's, this is like really a surrounding kind of thing. Try to try to remember to to see all you guys. So I'm very I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, ben and I actually lived in New York uh, for a couple of years before we started Ben and Jerry's. During uh, one of our <laughs> one of our prior uh, engagements, um, you know Ben Ben and I uh, grew up in Long Island. We went to uh, junior high school and high school together. Uh, and we met in seventh grade gym class, uh, running around the track together because we were the two slowest, fattest kids in the class. <laughs> uh, and we went through junior high school and high school. Um, I went to college. I went to Oberlin College in Ohio. Uh, it was pre-med and applied to and got rejected from 20 medical schools. <laughs> ben, uh, didn't want to go to college. His parents wanted him to go. His father and his sister filled out his applications for him. <laughs> he ended up going to Colgate uh, in upstate New York because the brochures said they had fireplaces in the dorm rooms, and Ben thought that was really cool. So Ben went there for a year and a half, and he went. He dropped out. He he went to Skidmore for a while. He dropped out. He went to NYU for a while. He dropped out. Uh, signed up with uh, a program called University Without Walls, which is one of these really progressive college programs uh, where you don't have to go to class because the world is your campus. And <laughs> you don't have to take tests. You get credit for learning. And Ben dropped out of there, too. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that was kind of our background. And uh, so we were essentially failing at everything we were trying to do. Uh, d during the time we lived in New York, uh, it was <coughs> after I got out of college, after Ben dropped out of his last college, um, 
and we were living down on East 10th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. This is about 1974. I had a job as a lab technician in a biochemistry research lab. Ben was driving a cab, and then he also uh, was, was working uh, as a pediatric admissions clerk at Bellevue Hospital. Uh, so, you know, we were, we were kind of hanging out in New York. And um, anyway, we, we decided to try to get together and do something fun, be our own bosses. We had always liked to eat quite a bit, so we thought we would do something with food. We picked ice cream. Didn't know anything about it. Learned how to make ice cream from a $5 correspondence course from Penn State. Uh, we were really broke at the time, so we split one course between us. It was two fifty dollars apiece. <laughs> Got A's on all our open book tests. Uh, ended up moving to Burlington, Vermont to open up an ice cream parlor um, on uh, on an investment of eight thousand uh, dollars, what you guys are like business students, you guys. So uh, I'll tell you when. when <laughs> this is like a little tangential, a little aside. Um, we'd each save four thousand dollars, and we were going to go into the local bank to try to borrow some money. Uh, this is after we moved to Vermont. Um, and, and in thinking about it, we realized that the bank might not really be that excited about loaning us money because uh, we, were, we were pretty young. I think we were 26 years old. Um, and we weren't married. We didn't have families. So we probably didn't appear that stable. Uh, and we didn't have any job experience. And we didn't have any business experience. And we didn't have any ice cream experience. And we didn't have any assets. And we didn't have any collateral. Uh, so we, we decided that we needed to write a really good business plan. <laughs> um, but we didn't know how to write a business plan. Um, uh, fortunately, we have a friend, Jeff Furman, who used to work for the Small Business Administration here in New York City. And Jeff got us a copy of a business plan that was for a pizza parlor in New York. And so what Ben and I did was we essentially copied the business plan, except every place where it said slice of pizza, we crossed it out and wrote an ice cream cone. Uh, and that's how we wrote our business plan that led to the incredible success of Ben and Jerry's. Uh, so we opened in May of 1978 uh, in this abandoned gas station in Burlington, Vermont. Um, and uh, <laughs> we were an artistic success. Um, we, we, people love the ice cream, but we never made any money, uh, particularly because the winters were so long and difficult in Vermont. And, th and that led us to, tr to start packaging our ice cream into pint containers so that we could get through the winters and sell it to grocery stores. Uh, and, and through a lot of uh, oh, unplanned steps uh, designed to help us survive, the, the business started to prosper uh, and grow. Uh, and we uh, built a factory and, uh, you know, we were expanding or whatever. And, uh, and then Ben and I looked at each other one day and said, uh, boy, what the heck is going on here? Uh, we're no longer ice cream guys. We're becoming businessmen. Uh, and we weren't spending our time making ice cream and scooping it over the counter to our customers. We were spending our time talking with lawyers and accountants and hiring people and firing people and writing memos and correspondence. Um, you know, it wasn't our idea of a good time. Uh, plus, uh, we had grown up in the 60s. And uh, so to us, business had all these negative connotations. Uh, and we felt like our business was becoming another cog in the economic machine. We were like, you know, good hippies. And uh, so we decided to get out of it. Uh, and then Ben ran into this friend of his, Maurice Purpura, who was this old eccentric restaurateur from southern Vermont down in Brattleboro. And uh, Ben was telling Maurice that we were going to get out of the business. Uh, and Maurice said, how can you do that, Ben? The business is your baby. It's, it's just starting to take off. And Ben said, well, Maurice, you know what business does. It takes advantage of its employees. It spoils the environment. 
It exploits the community. And Maurice said, uh, well, Ben, if there's something you don't like about the way business is done, why don't you just change it? And uh, as Ben says, that had never really occurred to him before. <laughs> Uh, so at that point, we decided to stay with the business and, and see if we could change it uh, and make it something that was supportive of the community and supportive of employees. Uh, and what, what was interesting about <laughs> that, uh, that decision um, was that we had no idea how to do it. Uh, nevertheless, that, uh, that didn't really prevent us from trying because from everything we had tried to do in business at that point, we hadn't know how to we hadn't know how to do it at the time we started to do it, uh, and so for us it was a matter of uh, trying things and seeing if they worked. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they didn't work. Uh, when it didn't work, we tried to learn from our mistakes and uh, make improvements and try again. And so in that regard, uh, this approach to trying to figure out how to have a, uh, a socially responsible, socially concerned, uh, socially active business. Uh, it, it, it was figuring it out just like we figured out how to make new flavors, anything else that we didn't know how to do. And so uh, in, in figuring out how to do it, uh, the first thing we did was to set up a foundation at the company, a charitable foundation. Uh, and for this, the company donated 7.5% of the pre-tax profits to. This was set up in 1985, uh, which was the highest percentage of any publicly held company. The, the corporate average is around 1.5%. And the reason we chose such a high percentage was that our feeling at the time was that a business is essentially a machine for making money so that if we wanted to be as of much benefit to the community as possible, we should give away as much money as possible. So we set up the foundation, uh, and the foundation started to receive grant requests from nonprofit organizations doing incredibly wonderful work. And the foundation could fund only a minuscule percentage of the requests coming in. And as we thought about it, we realized that all the foundations in the country uh, are in the same situation, that there are these tremendous unmet human needs and not nearly enough money to go around to address them. And as we thought about it, we, we began to realize that uh, as a business, we would never be able to give away enough money to have it really make a difference, and that the real power of our business was not in giving away some percentage of the profits, but was in how we operated on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we started to look at all the normal day-to-day -day operations of an ice cream company and started to see if there were ways to integrate social or environmental concerns into the normal day-to-day -day business. Because in that way, just by doing business as, as we operated, we would try to have uh, a benefit for the community. And so we looked at things like uh, how we did marketing, how we had financial uh, arrangements. We looked at uh, sourcing of ingredients. Uh, and that was how we, uh, we came to connect with the Grayston Bakery, which is the reason we're all here today. Um, so uh, Ben, uh, and, and Julius will probably talk a lot more about Grayston uh, because He's the guy from Grayston. Uh, but uh, just to let you know how we, we initially got involved, Ben ran into uh, Bernie Glassman, who founded Grayston. Uh, and uh, they were talking about what Grayston does and what Ben and Jerry's does. Uh, and uh, so we tried to figure out if there was a way that there was a bakery product that Grayston could make that Ben and Jerry's could put in our ice cream. And after a while, we figured out that they made some incredible brownies. Uh, and so Ben and Jerry started to purchase brownies from Grayston Bakery, uh, which uh, we put into a flavor called Chocolate Fudge Brownie. And it's this incredibly wonderful flavor. The brownies are great. And the flavor was so successful and so profitable for Ben and Jerry's that uh, the company now makes it in uh, Chocolate Fudge Brownie ice cream, Chocolate Fudge Brownie frozen yogurt, 
We make single serve cups with chocolate fudge brownie. We use the brownies in half baked ice cream. We use the brownies in half baked frozen yogurt. Any way we can use these brownies. Um, and, and what's interesting about it is that uh, Ben and Jerry's gets this incredibly delicious and profitable product. And at the same time, simply by purchasing the brownies from Grayston, we're able to support the work they do. And so contrary to uh, conventional business thinking, uh, where the idea uh, seems to be that if you try to do good in the community, it takes away from your ability to make money and to be successful, our experience is exactly the opposite. And that the more giving and caring Ben and Jerry's has been, the more successful it's become. Uh, well, that is probably a good time for me to stop because now we're in for a real treat. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who I've spent the last two days with <laughs> as I have been scooping out little cups of chocolate fudge brownie frozen yogurt, little cups of half-baked frozen yogurt, and as Julius personally puts his do-goody brownies plopped right on the top of those little scoops and lovingly hands them out. Uh, it's been great not just spending two days with Julius, but for Ben and Jerry's to be associated with Grayston. Uh, thanks for having me. And ladies and gentlemen, Julius Falls. Jerry Greenfield. <laughs> So the only way I could do this with him is to follow him, but I gotta tell you, I don't like following him. <laughs> Jerry, I love you. Um, ben Cohen and Jerry have been uh, very supportive of Grayston. We've been involved with them for 20 years, and so I thank you for that and that relationship, but thank you for the last two days. He's not kidding. For the last two days, uh, hours on end, we're scooping ice cream at Whole Food stores and putting brownies out there and promoting the Do Goody Brownie. So I thank you for coming down from Vermont to do that. Thank you, Sean, for dressing him up today. <laughs> Thanks, Columbia, for having us um, here today to talk about uh, social enterprise, how to do good and do well, uh, to talk about uh, the Grayston Bakery, talk about the relationship with Ben and Jerry's, talk about what's possible, what's possible uh, if you think differently if you look at things differently. As, as Jerry talked about, Ben had said, you know, I didn't, I didn't think about that. I, I didn't know that that was a possibility. Well, it is a possibility. It is a possibility that you can use business to do good, that you can use business to do good and do well. It's not just about the dollar. Now, you guys go to one of the top business schools in the country, and they're teaching you how to make money. But it's not just about making money. You can use business to do good and to do well. It's about people planet and profits. People, planet and profits, in that order. People, planet and profits. You don't have to give up one to serve the other. You don't have to give up profits to serve people. You don't have to give up profits to serve the planet. It's not just about the profit. It can be about the people and the planet as well. Business should serve humanity, not humanity serving business. It's about what the business can do for us. It's not what we can do for the business. I'd like to suggest that men and women who walk through the corporate door each day need to bring their hearts, need to bring their, their thoughts about the planet, their thoughts about people with them, not just worry about their BAs, their MBAs, their P&Ls, their balance sheets, their Excel spreadsheets. They need to think about how they're going to impact people. We are business people. We're not isolated from the consequences of our decisions. We're not isolated from the rivers we contaminate. We're not isolated from the ice caps we melt. We're not isolated from the people we discard. We're not isolated from the harm we do. We're responsible because we are powerful and because we can be response-able. We're able to respond to the needs of the world. So that's what Ben & Jerry's does. That's what Grayson is trying to do. We're, we're, we're responsible. Great. Ben & Jerry's is responsible in the way it looks at its packaging, in the way it looks at its manufacturing imprint, in the way it looks at its people. Now, I've been in a 20-year relationship with you, with them, um, and I can tell you that 
they don't do everything perfect, and Grayston sure as heck doesn't do everything perfect, but we're out there trying. Um, we're out there looking for ways of how we can impact this world in a positive way through the power of business, through the power of making money. They're also response able. They're supporting programs and innovations around the world, not the least of which is the one with, with Grayston. He'd been, uh, Jerry talked about the fact that 20 or so, it's actually brought closer to 23 years ago, that Ben and, and Bernie were talking about how to work together. At the time, Grayson was a very small company, and our success has been directly related to our relationship with, with ben, and, ben and Jerry's. We've been in partnership with them, making product for them for over 20 years now. Our success is totally tied to that relationship. Oftentimes when I'm speaking, some people will say to me, you know, you're, you're successful because of Ben and Jerry's, and I'll say, yes, absolutely. But it's not just that. We hope that uh, we bring something to the table, that they're, the chocolate fudge brownie ice cream being one of the top 10 flavors of Ben & Jerry's is not in spite of our brownie, but also because of the great tasting brownie that's in there. Our partnership with Ben & Jerry's has enabled us to grow by hiring more and more people in the community and giving them an opportunity. We started with, as I said, less than 10 employees. We're close to 60 employees now. We operated out of a former pasta factory Today we operate out of a uh, 23,000 square foot, $10 million facility. We're totally dependent on Ben & Jerry's at the beginning. Now we're building our own brand, the Do Goody Brownie that uh, Jerry so proudly wears. Um, but the relationship has impacted more than that. I mean, I can talk personally how the relationship has impacted me. I came to Grayson about 13 years ago. Uh, I showed up there to sell them chocolate and tried to offer them the chocolate for sale and they actually turned me down. They said, no, we don't want to buy your chocolate. And then I got a contact who had a contact who had a contact, those six degrees of separation, with someone in the White House and was able to offer Grayson an opportunity to be in the White House. And they said they would love to be in the White House. And I said, okay, then you need to buy my chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> and so they accepted and I brought them to the White House. But in bringing them to the White House, before that I had no idea what they were doing. They were just another bakery that I was trying to sell chocolate to. And so I had to research them to explain to the White House what this organization was that I was bringing there. And I found out some of the work that they were doing, that they were providing jobs to people in the community who would not otherwise have jobs, providing jobs to people who have not had anyone trust them or look for them to do anything positive, who already made up their mind that they were going to fail before they even got it started. And so I was very enamored with the organization and stayed involved with them. And about two years into my relationship with them, they invited me to come on board as director of marketing. And about a year into that, they invited me to come on as CEO. And so I've been CEO now for about 11 years with Grayson. And I got to tell you, it has changed my life. It has changed the way I look at life. It's changed the way I look at what's possible with business. Prior to that, I thought that the way you should handle your situation and what you love in life is you should handle that outside the business. So prior to that, if I wanted to do something that was good for the community, I volunteered outside my business. I would volunteer at church, or I'd volunteer at a shelter, or do something with a soup kitchen. But at Grayson, I get to see the power of business being used to change the community. We are now an organization that provides housing for formerly homeless people. We house, we have over 224 apartments. We are an organization that now has six community gardens. We provide community gardens that are not about just about beautification, but about growing food for people to eat. People come to those gardens, plant their gardens, plant their vegetables, and actually use them to eat. This is a source of food and nourishment for them. We provide health care for people living with HIV and AIDS, um, families and low-income families. And that got started because one family that uh, was familiar with Grace and wanted to support the housing that we were doing, one of their uh, siblings got sick with HIV. And they were able to provide him services that um, uh, people with low income, low income persons wouldn't be able to do. And so now they said, well, can we provide that service in this community? And so we provide uh, Reiki, Qigong, acupuncture, massage therapy for people who would not otherwise have the chance to access these services, help them make their lives a little more bearable while they're dealing with HIV and AIDS. And all of that started from a small bakery. All of that started because Ben and Jerry's took a chance on this small bakery and said, can you supply us a brownie for some ice cream? A new flavor that they were looking at, and a flavor that has taken off. And so now we've touched 2,200 families in the community of Yonkers because of the power of business. You may not even know all of the things and all of the impacts you have. I know that there are times when some of the employees come up to me and talk to me about the impact, particularly if they've left, they come back and talk to us about what we've done for them. 
And I know that we didn't just do it for them, that we may have provided an opportunity for employment, that they've done it for themselves. But it was a fact that there was a business there that was willing to give them an opportunity. Now, all businesses that are looking to do different don't have to do it through an employment model. How are you looking, how are you impacting your community? How are you impacting your employees? How are you impacting your other suppliers? Uh, how are you impacting your customers? What messages are you sending? These are things that Ben and Jerry's looks at. These are things we try to look at and how we're impacting the lives of people. Yonkers was a struggling city when, uh, when uh, Grayston moved into Yonkers. Today, it's, um, it's doing a lot better. Uh, we're all suffering from the most recent economic slide, down, downturn, meltdown, whatever term you want to use for that. Um, we're all suffering from that. But prior to that, you would have to bid for property in Yonkers. When we first came in, they were giving us property, asking us to develop property, asking us to develop housing in the community. They were begging us to take on people to hire them and give them jobs. Now in the community, as I said, you have to compete for land in the community because Yonkers has started to grow. We don't take full credit for that because we didn't do it alone. But we were a part of the organizations that came into Yonkers and started doing things differently, started looking at business in a different way, looking at building affordable housing, not at a loss, but not trying to quote unquote maximize the almighty dollar in development, taking into consideration the impact the building would have on the community, on the residents there, who would get an opportunity to live in the community. I have three of uh, uh, Grayson's employees here with me, uh, and I'll tell you that I, I was a little nervous before I came up to speak to you. It wasn't about you. It wasn't even about Jerry. It was about speaking in front of my, my three employees here. <laughs> um, and, and the message that I give to them when I, when I speak to them about what we're doing and why we're trying to do it. And so I'm proud of the things that I've seen in their lives. Uh, and I could spend hours talking to you about the lives that have been changed because a business chose to do business in a different way. So I implore you today to look at the power of business, that you have an opportunity to be response-able, not just responsible, but response-able, able to, able to respond to the issues. When they teach you in business, and Jerry talked to you about the business plan, and I teach about business plans, I'm going to make sure I never tell that story when I'm talking about business plans, though. <laughs> but what you're looking for is you're trying to identify a need in the marketplace. And this is a little bit different. This is trying to say what kind of need or what kind of service you can provide while filling your business need. And so you still have to be a business. I'm not asking you guys to go out, all of you, to go out and start nonprofits. They have their place and, they ha and there is a need for them. But the power of business. Did you know that the 51 largest economies, 51 out of the top 100 largest economies in the world are businesses? And that's if you compare the size of their revenues versus the, the GDP. 51 largest are now businesses. Businesses dominate this world. And so we have the chance to use that power to change the world. Ben and Jerry's in Grayston um, has, has begun to spur this movement. Jerry referred to a meeting between Bernie Glassman, the founder of Grayston, and Ben Cohen about 20, as I said, 23 years ago. That meeting was the beginning of an organization called Social Venture Network. And the Social Venture Network is a group of businesses that want to use business for good. But these are successful businesses. You know, ben and Jerry's a very successful business. Um, before it became public, uh, the numbers were like 350, 400 million dollars in sales. Now it's, uh, excuse me, not before it became public, before it was owned by Unilever. Now it's owned by Unilever. But you hear of uh, Stonyfield Farms by Gary Hirschberg. That was another member of this organization. Ottawa, the founder of Ottawa, is a member of uh, Social Venture Network. Body Shop, Eater Need Erotic, that's a member of this association. This organization of people who want to use business to do good. But they're not giving up on profits. They're not giving up on quality. They're just saying we can have a different kind of impact in addition to delivering a quality product and making profits. That's what's possible when you look at business doing different. And this is growing a movement that's talked about now. And they use many terms out there. You'll hear social entrepreneurship. You'll hear social enterprise. And the new term that's coming out of the White House, he's created, uh, our president's created an office of social innovation. And I cringe at the fact that there's now another term out there. But I assume the one that has the most money is the one that's going to win. So maybe social innovation will be the new term we talk about. But this has spurred a movement of people wanting to use business to do different. And none of them are giving up on the idea of making money. They're just saying we can do good and do well at the same time, that you don't have to give up the profits to make a difference in the world. What we want to do is we want to make the best brownie possible. 
And so we started making the do-goody brownie. When we started our, our vision statement, we have a vision statement at Grayson that was uh, created by both our ownership, which is the Grayson Bakery is owned by the Grayson Foundation. So we have a board of directors, by our management team, and by our staff. And we had a, a meeting over the course of a day and came up with a vision statement. And the first line of that vision statement is that we're going to make the best brownie that you've ever tasted. And so we're going to serve you some of those brownies afterwards, and I hope you enjoy the fact that they have Belgian chocolate in it. It has butter. It has uh, chocolate instead of cocoa powder. It's cage-free eggs. We even look at the type of supplies that we use and the impact that our products have. Uh, we talk about the type of packaging. And again, we're not perfect in all that we do. We just try and do the right thing. We have conversations, and we make a lot of mistakes along the way. We just hope we don't make any fatal mistakes along the way, that we can recover from them. But we talk about it, we put ourselves out there, and we ask people to give us their opinion on what they're doing. We meet with our employees on a monthly basis and share everything with them. We have an open book management model. We share all of our financial information with them and let them know what's happening, why it's happening, what's going on, and ask them for their participation in it. But it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to generate a profit to contribute it to our parent who happens to be a nonprofit, the Grayston Foundation. What does this mean to you? You guys are the, the future leaders tomorrow. You've, you've heard that before. You're, some of you are the future social entrepreneurs of tomorrow. We know that you're in this room. I know that to some degree I'm preaching to the choir, because if you weren't interested, you wouldn't be in the room. Now, I know also some of you are college students, so you're in the room because you thought you'd get the free ice cream before we spoke. But, <laughs> but most of you are here because you're interested in what we have to say about the notion of social entrepreneurship or social enterprise. So, what can you do? Well, first I say that it's, it's limitless. I, I'm, I'm not going to limit it. I know that if you had talked to uh, Jerry 23 years ago or what, um, when he started his company, talked to Ben, that they would have never dreamed that the company would have gotten to the point where it have gotten. It wouldn't have had the impact. And so you have a chance to dream and look at things in a very different way. You, you have the opportunity to look at people like Ben and, and look at people like Jerry and say, if they can do that, with the power of business and be successful as businesses, and now the definition of success can be further, uh, and the definition can be enlarged to be just beyond, to be beyond just profits. If they can be successful, I have the opportunity to do that as well. When you take the tools and the skill sets that you're getting here at Columbia, one of the finest institutions in this country, you can now take those tools and decide to use them in a different way. It would be akin to taking uh, the, the construction tools and building a different building than what someone told you. This is the only building you can build. You can now build a business in a different way. The question is, will you be serving that business, or will that business be serving you? Will that business be serving the community? Where are you going with your business career? What are you going to do? I can tell you what Grayson is trying to do. I can tell you where we're trying to go. We're going to continue to leverage our relationship with Ben and Jerry's. And they've been kind enough and supportive enough to allow us to do that. When you get a chance to see the wrapper, you'll see that on our wrapper it says that we're the brownie artisans for Ben and Jerry's. They've allowed us to use their brand to leverage to build our brand. They could have charged us for that. They have not done that. They could have said no. They have not done that. And this was not without any risk. What if we made, well, we would never do that. But what if we made a bad brownie? <laughs> that would affect their brand but they've taken that chance with us because they know the impact that their business can have on us, the impact that they can have on the community, the impact they can have on people. So we're going to continue to leverage that relationship. We're going to continue to expand our business beyond uh, uh, just uh, the brownie inclusions and supplying people like Ben and Jerry's. We also supply haagen which was a key account for us to garner. Uh, nothing is like the, the amount of business that we get from Ben & Jerry's. There is actually nowhere near that amount of business out there with any other customer. They are the number one selling an ice cream with an inclusion, by far. But the getting the ha haagen account said to a lot of people that Grayston Bakery could make a quality brownie. Now, that statement should have already been out there because Ben & Jerry's bought that brownie. But some said that they were buying that brownie because of their social mission. And haagen bought a brownie that had nothing to do with the social mission. And so we make a quality product. So we're going to continue to grow our inclusion business, but also we've launched into this retail package business with the Do Goody Brownie. And we're going to be try and become the brownies, the, the Ben and Jerry's of brownies. They're the super premium brownie, the fun-loving uh, brand in brownies, excuse me, in ice cream. We're going to be the super premium in brownies. That's why we use chocolate instead of cocoa powder. We use butter instead of vegetable oil. And we use cage-free eggs. We're responsible for how we look at things. But my charge to you today, my charge to you today, when you're hungry, 
buy do goodies. <laughs> when you're hungry for something cold, buy do goodies and put some Ben and Jerry's ice cream on it. But most importantly, contemplate how you're going to use your skill set and how you and your skill set can impact the world in a positive manner. You can do good and do well. That's what Ben and Jerry's is trying to do. That's what Grayson is trying to do. Thank you for your time today. So that concludes our formal remarks. So officially business formal. Uh, we want to open it up to, to questions and uh, comments, anything that you folks have on your mind, uh, both you know, questions for the guys, either individually about their backgrounds, about their companies, um, and, uh, and comments, ideas they have as well. Yeah, oh, so, yeah, and if you can speak to the mic, that would be great. And, and by, by contract, we have to see you for half an hour before we serve brownies or ice cream, so uh, you'll have to ask some questions. Hi. Um, a lot of us in this room came to business school to uh, save the world, and uh, those of us who did that do a lot of studying of social ventures, and one of the things we study is scaling. Um, there's only one Grayston, as far as I know. Um, can you talk about if you've ever tried to make uh, Grayston in a different <coughs> city, and if you did, what happened, and if you didn't, why not, and are you thinking of doing that? So just scaling. Sure. So in terms of Grayston specifically, we, are, we do have a desire to continue to grow the model um, in Yonkers. We are looking at other opportunities to where else we would move the, the model, and we're, we're looking at, for instance, the, the West Coast. As we grow the Do Goody Brownie, we know that it, it's neither efficient or effective to ship brownies from Yonkers, New York, to California. So we've already begun to explore the concept of uh, building another facility. But the, uh, the notion of what we think in terms of scaling our business is, goes beyond just Grayston. And we talk about what is possible with business in general. And so we're in, uh, in relationship through uh, most of it informally talking to others who are looking to do what we do. And whether they're doing it as a bakery or, or otherwise, there's actually a bakery out on the West Coast that looks very similar to the Grayson organization in that it has a nonprofit, nonprofit parent company that owns a social service and then also operates a bakery. Um, but, but we talk to a lot of businesses, and as I said, there's a movement out there. There's an organization called Social Enterprise Alliance, and these are people who want to use business in a very formal manner with a social mission, um, and not simply want to be corporate responsible, which is a great thing, but corporate responsibility simply means you will not do bad. You will not do bad versus going further and saying you have a social mission to actually do some good. Um, and so there's a growing movement of people wanting to do that, and I was just in New Orleans this past weekend speaking to uh, 400 um, organizations that want to use business with a social mission. And so that's where we see a part of our role is to scale the field as well as looking at growing our business. You're welcome. Hello. Uh, we actually got to study Ben and Jerry's in our strategy class, our professors right here, so we got to learn a lot about the social and environmental um, initiatives that you've taken. Um, and I was kind of surprised because at the end we found out that you're now owned by uh, Unilever Holy. Um, how do you think that that plays into kind of being able to, all, to drive the social and environmental initiatives, but also now being owned by a major multinational company that might not have those same kind of initiatives in mind? Uh -huh. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move up here. So, uh, you know, just, just as a little background, uh, Ben & Jerry's got purchased, uh, I think, in 2000 or, or, you know, 2000, 2001. And at the time, Ben & Jerry's was a public company. We had gone public in 1985. Uh, and uh, so there were a couple of offers for the company, one from Unilever, one from another company. And... Uh, uh, we didn't want to sell the company, but we were a public company. Uh, and uh, so the way, uh, you know, the way laws are written, the board of directors' primary responsibility is to look out for the fiduciary interests of the shareholders. Um, and that the board can look at impact on employees, impact on suppliers, impact on the community, et cetera. But, but uh, when push comes to shove, it's about getting the most money you can for your shareholders. Um, 
And so selling the company was not something that we wanted to do. Um, and we looked at some alternatives. We tried to put private equity together, but it, but we weren't able to put something together that worked. And it was, it was not about Unilever per se. Uh, it was about uh, being owned by somebody else. Uh, as you say, we, we just were not confident that uh, anybody who owned the company uh, would, would have the same approach to a social mission that we did. Um, and so, you know, how, how things been the last nine years? You know, uh, I would say that Unilever, uh, first of all, I should tell you, for those of you who are not familiar with Unilever, they're this uh, large consumer goods company uh, uh, based out of London now. Uh, they, have, they have brands like Lipton Tea and Ragu Spaghetti Sauce, Wishbone Salad Dressing. Uh, they have a very good sense of humor. On the same day, they bought Ben & Jerry's. They also bought SlimFast. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and, and the reason they wanted to buy Ben & Jerry's was because the company was successful and they wanted to continue to be successful. And they also understand that to a certain degree, the success of the company is based on how it's been operated. So I think, in theory, uh, they are very supportive of that. Uh, in, in terms of operationalizing that or implementing it, uh, they, they simply don't have the same level of experience that Ben & Jerry's does. Uh, and at the same time, the way they, the way they are organized as a business uh, is, I mean, it's fairly typical of, of large companies that manage brands. So they have this kind of matrixed uh, organization so that they have a supply chain that looks out for all their brands. They hire advertising companies. They, you know, they have manufacturing in their particular area. So they're not, uh, they're not familiar with the idea of looking at the different functions of a business and seeing about ways to integrate social concerns into that. Uh, and so to ask them to look at things in that way is, is a different way for them to operate. So I think most of the, about half of the functions of Ben & Jerry's have been integrated into Unilever. Uh, manufacturing is part of Unilever. Uh, human resources, finance, uh, supply chain, uh, what else? I mean, the, the things that, that remain autonomous under Ben & Jerry's are uh, product development, uh, marketing, retail shops. So in those areas, Ben & Jerry's is able to uh, exercise more control over its social mission and uh, you know, Unilever doesn't have a problem with that. It's just that in the areas that the company doesn't control, it's much more challenging. Do I have to follow up to that? You have to ask the moderator if that if you can. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, on the microphone. They want on. I'm Kathy Clark. I teach a social entrepreneurship here. It's a course here. Okay. I'm Julius, nice How to you see doing? you. Good to um, see you again. I haven't seen Julius in a while, but I took a class about five years ago through his then halfway done manufacturing facility in about 15 degree weather and my students never forgave me. <laughs> they were thrilled to see you. Um, my follow-up question is, um, in my class we've talked about B Corps, we've talked about the difficulty of kind of prepping a privately owned company for the experience of being bought and trying to, to maintain a mission um, through some sort of exit. And my question to you is, is there anything you think now in retrospect that you could have done or should have done to make this transition easier or is it simply structural and a company like Unilever you know is going to act the way that you've described uh, you know it's it's very difficult and uh, I mean it's kind of a cliche to say it but it's a great question it's kind of the essential question mm -hmm. as you have these entrepreneurial mission driven founder driven companies as as they mature 
and and reach uh, a certain size how do you maintain that mission whether it's through uh, after after they might get purchased or even if they don't get purchased if they remain independent but the founders are no longer there how do you how do you put into place uh, something structural to, to maintain that mission and uh, I would say the jury is out on that one. Uh, you know, there, there's talk about setting up some type of uh, socially responsible holding company, raising money uh, among investors who uh, who see the value of something like that. But it's, uh, you know, if, if you kind of look back at, oh, say Ben and Jerry's as one of a handful of companies that, you know, 20 or 30 years ago started getting into this. And, and Julius was talking about the body shop, uh, which was a real pioneer, Stonyfield Farm yogurt, Patagonia, uh, Toms of Maine. Uh, oh, there's, you know, there's more out there, but uh, it, it's sort of a question that's, that's all coming due at this point. May I add, um, this kind of relates to the earlier question about going to scale. One of the issues that we're having going to scale is resources. And so we, we, we raised the question of should we sell equity so that we can bring more resources to the table to be able to go to scale. And the risks that come to that and, and the, the risk of getting larger, and we're not even talking about being public at this time, we're talking about private placement. But if we went that much further and then became public, how do you control that? And then how do you make sure you still meet your mission? So, I mean, it's, it's a real issue. I mean, you know, part, part of the question that, that you asked is about, is it structural? Uh, and you know, I, I don't know enough about sort of the historical development of corporations and business, but somehow in this country, corporations have developed to the point where uh, the purpose of corporations is to maximize profit. Uh, and if you think about it, it's completely absurd. Mm -hmm. It is outrageous. It is, uh, I mean, how could you have an entity in the society that, as Julius mentioned, is probably the most powerful force in the society. And the purpose of this most powerful force in the society is to look out for itself, is not to think about anything, <laughs> to not be a good neighbor, but to say, how can I make the most money I can for myself? It's outrageous. How do we let it get away with that? What, you know, I am stumped. You know, business, uh, business is not bad. Business is not evil. Business is not negative. I mean, I'm in business. A lot of us are going to be in business. Business is essentially this, this neutral tool. And you can use it for good. You can use it for whatever. But uh, business acts in its own self-interest. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, so you have this most powerful force in the society that is essentially acting in its own self-interest. It is, by definition, selfish thinking about itself. You know, and so we do all these surveys of the general public, and people don't like corporations. People don't trust corporations. Why? Is it because they're cynical? No, it's because businesses act in their own self-interest. When, when you have a company like Grayston, when you have a company that, that is not acting in its own self-interest, people are amazed and they want to do all they can to support those companies because it is so different. Um, my question is also a little bit of a follow-up and I'm uh Jessamyn Waldman and I run a baking social enterprise here in New York City. Um, and before anything else, I just wanted to um, say that I recently read Julius's book, Mission Inc., which is one of the sort of most comprehensive um, books that I've read on the topic. So thank you for that. Thank you, Jessamyn. And <laughs> my, um, my question was a little bit of a follow-up also, and I think you addressed this a little bit. But I'm wondering when and if um, Grayston would ever consider selling to Unilever. <laughs> And this selling, the selling to a company, yeah, selling the business. If the foundation, if there would ever become a, a time when the foundation to support its own growth in Yonkers would ever, do you think, consider selling Greystone Bakery? 
Wow, that's a big question. <clears throat> um, I, I think it would. I think it would get conversation uh, because I wouldn't want to dismiss anything like that out of hand. Um, but I, I don't think it would happen um, because I think the the concerns for what Grayston can do um, and the impact it has on the community go beyond the dollars it has in the community. I mean, when we were looking to build a new facility, um, the, the, some of the parameters were set up was that you know we needed to stay in Southwest Yonkers. Um, it wasn't even just Yonkers. We had offers from New York City to move it to New York City. Um, for those of you that no, don't know, Yonkers is not a part of New York City. It's not the sixth borough. Um, it, it's its own mun municipality. And we had offers to move to New Jersey and, and other areas. And even moving to another part of Yonkers was a major statement. When you sell your business, you give up the rights to have those kinds of conversations. Yeah, you can put some things in contractually to hold it in a place for a certain amount of time. But most of those are very difficult to enforce if the business starts to fail. And it's not very hard to position a business that it needs to move because of its own survival. So, I mean, you would have a, a lot of concerns about moving, um, the business moving, who the people would be hired. I mean, there's, a, there's more than just a business there, um, as, as Jerry said. I mean, one of the things that, uh, I, it's so pleasing to hear you say how ridiculous that is, because I've said it, and then I get these looks at me, and, but I, now you're hearing it from a guy who, who ran a very, very successful business, that a business only looks out for one of its stakeholders. You know, and, and there's a series of stakeholders in a business, and, um, uh, and other business people have alluded to this, um, uh, and talked about the fact that they've made money, probably more money than they should be allowed to make because of the way the system is structured. And, and the system is structured to, for the stakeholder called the shareholder to, to be, benefit from it. So uh, I, I don't think that would happen in the Excuse me. Um, so I wonder, um, the reason that you sold was because you went public. So I'm, I'm just curious, do you think it was a mistake going public? And what would you advise other companies in terms of going public? other social mission companies. Seriously, because it all started with that. You know, I, I think you'd probably get a different answer from Ben than you would from me. Uh, I think Ben feels like it's possible to go public and still maintain control of the company. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I'm just not convinced of that. And you guys went public just in Vermont, is that right? Well, we initially went public in Vermont uh, in 1984, and then about a year and a half later, we had a national public offering. But would you like not advise, seriously, would you not advise other similar socially minded companies? You know, would you advise? You know, just, just personally, I would, but uh, I'm not so confident in my, in my judgment that I wouldn't say that you should talk to a lot of people about it. Yeah. Well, and the trade off then is. You don't have the same resources, right? I mean, for, for Ben and Jerry's, the time was they were ready to try to go big and to go from a little one-room production facility to a you know kind of state-of-the-art facility at the time and, and really grow their business. I think that's the, the question then. The, it becomes, what is it that your trade-off is? If you do go public, what resources does that bring you, and, and what's you know what is the trade-off when you do that? We got time for a couple more questions. Here, you're going to go first, and then you'll be on deck over there. How about that? Yeah, hi. Um, you guys make fun products, ice cream, brownies, the body shop, Patagonia. What about non-tangible products, like things that Wall Street creates? Can you comment on how you might think they could, I don't know, maybe somebody can create a brokerage house that, you know, is owned by a not-for-profit or something. But it seems that those are non-tangible products would be one of the big differences. Yeah. I mean, uh I think there's ways to do it. Um, you know, for, for Ben and Jerry's, uh, ice cream uh, was kind of a vehicle for, for us to, uh, to reach our customers and reach the larger community. And uh, we tried to set up our business and our marketing per se, our relationships uh, with our customers, with our staff, so that uh, we were clear about our mission and we tried to establish 
the idea that we were all working together to help reach this uh, this mission, and that ice cream was the product that we made in order to do that. Uh, so we were not just selling a product per se. Uh, we were uh, working in tandem with our customers and with our staff to bring about a different kind of world. And that if you were a person who supported that, uh, we wanted you to purchase our products, we wanted you to come work at our company, uh, and if you didn't happen to support it, you know, buy somebody else's product. Uh, and so I think you can do that with with a financial services company or whatever, whatever, whatever kind of uh, product or service, there are ways to uh, structure it so that that you're you're working to bring about a, a a different kind of result than simply just selling that product or that service. And I can give you a couple of examples of that. The the term do goody was actually um, created by a marketing firm outside of Washington called Equals Three, um, and they volunteered. They, the gentleman heard me speak in Florida, and he came up to me and said, um, can I do something for you? And I said, yes. And I said, but you have to say it two more times. My rule is if you offer me something, and you offer it for free, you have to say it you know, three times so I can actually believe you. You weren't just making it up to be sociable. So he said it three times, and I said, all right. I'd like you to help me develop a product. And so um, we worked with him, and he developed the, the name Do Goody. The company we're working with now um, that's helping us uh, look at the packaging and whether or not we're putting the branding out um, in, a, in a strong enough manner is a company that you should actually reach out to. And I'm sure he'd come speak uh, for you, speak to your class. Is um, BBMG and uh, uh, Raphael Brembard, and um, uh, he's a B Corp, and um, and they, their company wants to do good as well as do good work, um, and, and they do excellent work, and and they represent some uh, some very good brands out there. And they want to be involved with Grayson. And so um, he, he's done a lot of work with us, talking to us, and he's helping us look at how we're branding our products. So um, uh, there are companies out there that do services as well as products that, that want to do good. All right, we've got one here, and then why don't we go one there, and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break after that. It was just a little low. Um, this is actually a follow-up about the Do Goody Brownie. I was, I mean, you've spoken a little bit about the need for resources as well as how your relationship with Ben and Jerry's has really allowed Grayson Bakery to attain, um, you know, success. And so now you're launching this consumer brand, which seems kind of like a step outside of your, um, you know, what you've been really focusing on. Um, is this a, a, a real big strategic shift in and you know the direction that you see the company headed, and sort of what are the challenges and risks associated with this, and, and what are you learning from this process? Well, that could take quite a bit of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just just stepping outside of B two B and you know going directly to, to the consumer, you know, it, just it's so a huge, comment. it's a huge yeah. step. Um, it's one we made though um, after looking at a, a lot of different factors, um, not the least of which was um, we were on sixty minutes um, in January of two thousand four. And at the time, our first business that we were in was making cakes. And so we were a bakery, we made cakes, we sold to the top restaurants here in New York City, but we were losing money on each and every cake that we sold. Um, and so we were looking for opportunities to grow our business, and then the Ben and Jerry's relationship happened. And so that's the part of the business that grew. The cakes kind of stagnated. Um, and then we were on 60 Minutes in January 2004. The timing is very important to understand the, how, how things work. So in January 2004, we had not yet moved into our new facility. And the idea was when we got to the new facility, we would be able to make cakes in a more efficient manner. We'd be able to set up an automated line to be able to produce cakes in an effective way. But we hadn't gotten there yet. In January, we're on the air at 60 Minutes. And I'm sure many of you have seen that commercial with UPS where those guys launched their website and they sold one item and they were like, yay. And then they sold a few hundred and they're like, yay. And then they sold several thousand like, oh my God, that was us. Um, we started selling cakes, more cakes um, for three days. We actually didn't know how many cakes we had sold because they were coming in so fast to, the, um, to our system, which was not prepared to do that. Prior to that, we would sell one or two cakes a week. I'm not exaggerating. We put up our website because people wanted to know more about Grayston. And if they bought a cake, we were fine with losing $20, $30 a cake because it was one a week. No big deal. Don't worry about it. Sell a few thousand cakes, losing $20, $30 a cake. Not good at all. Um, and so we immediately pulled down our website within like three days. Not pulled down the website. Actually, what we did was we literally just kept raising price each day. We'd, we'd raise the price <laughs> until people stopped ordering. So, okay, there's the price. And that was 
and that was the price on the website. <laughs> Um, and so, but what we've learned from that, um, and the comments we got from people, uh, people who bought the cakes, people who called in, people who wrote in, what we learned from that was that people wanted to be in relationship with us. And we said, how do we do that? How do we get closer to them? And so we took a step back. We, by the time we got through the whole process of selling all the cakes, shipping all the cakes from the, from the 60 Minutes thing, we had an opportunity to evaluate the facility. And we said we would need to invest somewhere around three quarters of a million dollars quadruple our business in cakes, which at the time was about a half a million, so we said we needed to get to $2 million, and maybe at that point we'd be break even. And so we said, well, that's probably not the way to go. And so we exited the cake business um, formally in 2006, which brings to mind another conversation around mission versus margin. I had a fight with the board members because they thought making cakes was our mission. I said, no, that's not our mission. Cakes are just a product that we were making. So we exit the cake business, and we took a step back and said, what do we do? What are our assets? Um, what can we make? And what's available, what's, what's available in the marketplace? And so we looked at, we make brownies. We make the best brownies you can try. And you'll, you'll find out in the, in the next room. We make, we make a darn good brownie. We have a relationship with Ben & Jerry's. What is that relationship around? It's around two things. One, they're a super premium brand, so high up, upscale. And so we looked to make a product that was upscale. And our relationship with Ben & Jerry's is about what? Brownies. So we said, can we take that? And then we looked at the market and said, is there a super premium brownie in the marketplace? And we determined that there was not. There are good brownies out there, no question about it. There are bad brownies out there, no question about it. But there wasn't a super premium brownie. So we, could we become that? Could we become the Ben & Jerry's in brownies, the super premium brownie? And that's what we determined we would do. And so that's how we got into the brownies. But the big issue there is just what you referenced also, huge risk and a huge amount of resources. And so we launched in um, uh, uh, initially December of 2000, get my dates right, 2007, really 2008. Um, we, we launched in 2008, and the brownie was immediately picked up in a lot of different places. Within, I made a presentation in October of 2007 with a brownie wrapped in a um, copy of the wrapper. It wasn't even the, the printed wrapper, a copy of the wrapper, wrapped in that paper, stapled, taped, the whole bit, made the presentation to the largest natural foods distributor in the country, United Natural Foods, and they said, yes, we want it in all seven of our um, eastern, which is Midwest to the East Coast distributing centers. We said, no, can we just go in two? But we had to really tell them that it wasn't about volume, it was about we didn't have the marketing dollars to support it in, in that, that large of an area. And they said, sure. And then they promptly placed an order for five DCs and a month later for the other two. So we were immediately, by February, we were in seven distribution centers around the country. And so we marched through with that for the most part of uh, 2008. And the latter part of 2008, they came back and asked us to go into the West Coast. And so we're in the, uh, the Denver distribution center as well, which gets us down into the northern part of Texas, as well as the rest of uh, the Rockies and the, and the Midwest. We can't support that. We don't have those kinds of dollars. And so what we've made a decision now is we went back to them and we said, you can still buy it, but we're not doing anything in way of supporting it. We're not giving you any more marketing money. We're not doing any demos. We're not doing anything. You can buy the brownie. As long as you pay for the brownie, we're fine. But we're going to focus our dollars. And this, quite, quite frankly, was in a conversation that I had with um, Jerry, with Ben Cohen, with a few other people that came together to talk to us about the Do Goody Brownie. And we said, we have very limited dollars, so how do we maximize those dollars? Spreading them over the course of the country just wasn't going to work. It would have little impact anywhere. And so we're, we're focusing our dollars here in the Northeast. New York, primarily, but then out and up through New England has been our, our best markets, and that's what we're going to do. But even that takes so much resources. And so we're struggling with that. And we are looking to raise uh, funds. And one of the considerations is, would we sell equity? And I can tell you now, we're not considering selling majority stake. We are looking to sell a minority stake in the company. Um, and then we have to figure out how to do that, who do you sell to, and what are their, what are their, what are their needs as they're investing in the company as well, and, and they have their desires. So, so thank you. So it's great. You've learned uh, not only w what things hopefully to do, but also what not to do between selling cakes at $20 a loss <laughs> and uh, making your business plan with the pizza for an ice cream business. 
Uh, I think we are about out of time. You know, can we do? We'll do one like quick, quick question, question like and then uh, right after that last question, we're going to uh, be outside with product, and also Julius is going to be signing copies of his uh, book. Mission Inc. will be on sale out there in the lobby. So go ahead, take us out. Just as an ice cream fan, wondering what your biggest failures were in terms of flavors. Sean can help you with that. <laughs> Sugar plum ice cream was one that was uh, comes to mind about 20 years ago. Peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly, I know. Fred and ginger. Fred and ginger. Fred, Fred and ginger. <laughs> There's a lot. There's a lot. Thank you all. Thank you.